Good morning and welcome to worship with us here at Vinji Lutheran Church. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us wherever you are as we worship our God together. I hope you've got your cup of coffee ready. Uh, I've got mine and I'm sitting here in our Vinji Fellowship Hall having fellowship with my coffee. Uh, it's not quite the same. The coffee is good, but I miss all of you and can't wait for the day when we can have fellowship together right here at Vinji. Stay tuned as we try to get to that point and know that we are with you wherever you are today. A couple of announcements to get us started for worship. One, uh, this afternoon at 2 p.m., our Vinji kids have the opportunity to go sledding at Green Lake Bible Camp. If you haven't signed up, that's okay. We'll still take you. Come join us at 2 p.m. today at Green Lake. Bring your sleds and we'll have some fun together. Secondly, next week, even more fun, we're going to have our Vinji Zoom annual meeting. I know you're all super, super excited for that. It's way better even than the Super Bowl. Uh, we'll have tons of fun reviewing the past year and looking forward to the year ahead uh, and doing some important business of the church. But here's the deal. We really need you. So this is me begging you, please show up. If we don't have 50 people, we can't have a meeting. And by the way, you don't want to leave me and Pastor Andres and Vicar Kate all alone in a Zoom room with Pastor Justin, do you? That would be a pretty horrible experience. So this is Pastor Dane begging you, please show up. Find more information on your email or at the church website, or if all else fails, call the church office and we'll get you whatever information you need. Finally, uh, Lent is just around the corner, believe it or not. On February 17th, we have Ash Wednesday service, and right now we're planning an in-person Ash Wednesday service, complete with ashes. Uh, but we know that for some of you, you won't be able to come here that day, and that's okay. That's why we're providing this year ashes to go. Uh, you can find those in the little welcome box outside of our main entrance at Vinji. Uh, it's a little box, and there will be these little packets of ashes with instructions of how to use those at home. Uh, please, if you need ashes, come there, get them ahead of time, and uh, you can do this ritual even in your own homes or even as you're on your way to Vinji for the in-person services if you don't want a pastor touching your forehead. All are welcome here. All right, I think that's enough for announcements today. Now on to worship. Today we're going to hear the story of Jesus challenging our assumptions about the Sabbath day and what it means to worship. As you hear this story, I want you to be reminded that it's okay to worship God wherever you are and that God calls us not just to rules and regulations, but a purpose in this world to love God and love our neighbors wherever we are and that we can live lives of worship seven days a week. Now on to worship. Let's join together for the call to worship, even with our coffee. As we gather for worship, we gather in the name of the God who came into this world to show us the way. Let us gather in the name of Jesus, the light of the world, the one who shows us God's love. The heavens open, the spirit descends, a voice echoes over the waters. This, this is, is my, my son, the, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the one who came into this world for us, the one who brings hope for the hopeless. The one, one who, who changes, changes our world. This is the one who brings good news to the poor and stands with the oppressed. This is the one who heals the sick and even raises the dead to life. This, this is, is the, the one, one whose love conquers all. His love reaches to the end of the earth. His love is big enough for you and me. His love is big, big enough, enough for us all. He calls ordinary people like you and me to share good news, to heal, and bring light and love to this world. We go, go in Jesus' name. Hear God's word for you and me. You are my beloved child, with whom I am well pleased. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are mine. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord of the Sabbath, your followers were told not to work on the Sabbath, and yet they boldly plucked grain to show that you are Lord of all. The world tells us not to rest on the Sabbath. Show us how to rest boldly, rejecting conventions that go against your will, and instead praying and resting as you did up on the mountain. For the glory of your word and work, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from the book of Psalm 92, a song for the Sabbath day. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O God, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Word of God, word of life, Thanks be to God. Well, hi everyone. Brooklyn and I are playing some games this morning. We really like to play games. We're playing some Candyland right now. We're also a big fan of the squirrel game, right? It's called, actually, it's the Sneaky Snacky Squirrel Game, which is a lot of fun. And what game is this that we like? Guess who. Guess who. Did you get this for Christmas? Yeah. yeah. So we play a lot of games in our house, and uh, games always have rules. I'm sure you've noticed this when you play games, and maybe it's not even board games, but maybe you're playing games outside like t-ball. Um, always games have rules. Are rules important? Why are they important, Brooklyn? Because then you will, then the person who's not flying the world, they'll only win, and not the person who's playing with you won't get a chance to win. That's right. Rules are important that uh, games are played fair, and we think about other people when we follow the rules too, right? It's not just about us winning, but how we can how we can play with other people. I think some of the most important rules aren't actually like found in the game rule book, but some of the most important rules are that games should be fun, right? We play games because they're fun, and we want to have fun. Uh, that's why we play the Sneaky Snacky Squirrel, and we play Candyland, and Guess Who, and T-Ball, because we want to have fun, and we want to have fun with our friends, and our brothers and sisters, and our mommies and daddies. Jesus is going to talk about some rules uh, in a story today, and he's going to talk about the rules having kind of a bigger purpose, too. And Jesus is going to teach us just what you said, Rookie, that rules really exist for other people. The rules don't exist so much for us uh, to win and to cheat by knowing the rules better than someone else, but the rules are there to keep things fair. And we follow the rules because it's better for other people uh, when we follow the rules. So the purpose of all the rules that God gives us and the Ten Commandments and everything else, those rules are there. God gives these rules to us so that we can live uh, a happy and a good life and that we have good relationships with each other and that we have good relationships with God too. That's why we have rules that help us play these games. That's why we have rules to help us live our lives, that we can do so fairly with others uh, and we can live in community with one another and be happy. Can we say a quick prayer? All right, let's pray, everybody. Dear God, thank you for rules, and thank you that you give us rules to help us live with you and with each other. Let us have fun when we play our games and when we live our lives. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. We hope you're having a great time. Get out and play some games sometime soon. Bye. The gospel for today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Hear the good news. 
One Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked some heads of grain, rubbed them in their hands, and ate them. But some of the Pharisees said, What you are doing is not lawful on the Sabbath. Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath, so that they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come and stand here. The man got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? After looking around at all of them, Jesus said to them, stretch out your hand. And the man did so, and his hand was restored. But the Pharisees were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In my family growing up, we had a beloved Sunday tradition. Maybe some of you have it too. It wasn't Sunday worship. It wasn't fellowship hour after worship. It wasn't even sitting in front of the TV watching the Vikings play, usually lose on Sunday afternoons. No, this loved Sunday tradition was the 20 minutes that it took to drive from the parking lot of our church back to our home. 20 minutes where my parents, my brother and I would reflect on, question, and pick apart the service as a family. Now, I should stop to say before I go any further that I credit these car rides as an important piece of my early religious education, where my family would share what each of us had heard in the sermon that day, what we agreed with and what we didn't agree with. A 20-minute car ride where, as a young child, I was free to ask nearly any question I could think of, and a car ride where I watched my parents build and maintain relationships as they shared their post-worship interactions with one another. But occasionally, and maybe even a little more than occasionally, our conversations would veer from constructive reflection and note comparing into something a little different. There might be a lull in the conversation, and then, did anyone but me see the typo in the PowerPoint? It might start. Someone might add, well, what about when that microphone squealed? And I might chime in from the back seat. Was it really necessary that we sang all six verses of that one hymn? Someone else thought that the sermon was too long. Someone else thought the announcements were too long. Oh, and don't forget about the prayers I would jump in. I thought that the prayers were too long, too. Now, I would be lying if I said that these conversations weren't at least a little bit fun. But sometimes, sometimes, by the time that we were pulling into our driveway back home, we would be so caught up in the details of everything that we thought went wrong in church that day that we just about missed the whole point of going to church in the first place. I feel bad outing my family like this. And believe me, I did think twice before telling this story today. But something tells me that maybe, just maybe, we might not be the only family that has this Sunday tradition. And if you're not the type of person or family that finds themselves getting lost in the details of a church service, then maybe it's something else for you. Sports, school, politics, whatever it is, so fixated on the details that you miss the purpose. Well, we have one of these stories in our gospel passage for today where on two separate occasions, Jesus, Jesus gets caught in a debate about the rules of the Sabbath, the day of rest. A little Bible 101 for you. The first mention of the Sabbath comes in the first few verses of the Bible. You all know this. In the book of Genesis, God blessed the seventh, seventh day and rested from all of the work that God had done in creation. The next mention of the Sabbath comes in another familiar story, when Moses is given the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. One of the commandments, maybe some of you memorized this in confirmation, one of the commandments is to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day 
is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. When we think of the Sabbath, this is what we think of, right? God rested on the seventh day, and because we were made in God's image, because we are made in God's image, we also rest on the seventh day. So, back to our story for today, when Jesus and his disciples are walking through the grain field and they pick some grain to eat, the Pharisees who see this quickly jump in to chastise them. What are you doing, they say. This isn't lawful on the Sabbath. The unlawfulness of the act has nothing to do with the fact that Jesus and his disciples are taking food from another person's property. That's fine. That actually was allowed under Jewish law as long as they picked the grain with their hands and not with tools. It wasn't even the fact that they were picking grain. It was the specific act of grinding down the grain to make it edible to eat that was considered unlawful. Because that specific act was considered work. And the Sabbath was a day of rest. It was a problem not of theft. It was a problem of timing. But in picking this fight, and on a technicality nonetheless, the Pharisees maybe had a little uh, post-church car ride energy in their response. So fixated on the rules that were meant to guide the day of rest that they missed the reason for the day itself. When we think of the Sabbath, we think of a day of rest for ourselves, right? You were made in the image of God, and God rests on the Sabbath, so you rest on the Sabbath. But the purpose of the day, the purpose that the Pharisees missed, the deeper meaning of the Sabbath is actually much deeper and much more powerful than that. Because the Sabbath is mentioned a third time, after creation and after the Ten Commandments. And this time we're given a reason for the Sabbath, and it's not about us. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, it says in Deuteronomy. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Why? Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Remember, God says, remember that you were slaves who were treated with no dignity and got no rest. Yeah, so don't do that. Don't do that to your kids. Don't do that to the foreigners in your town. Don't do that to the people who work for you. Don't even do that to your animals. There is no question about who is included in this. It is for everyone. Let them rest. The Sabbath isn't about us. It's a little bit about us. You were made in the image of God, and so you get to rest. But so was everyone else. So they get to rest too. And to love and respect your neighbor who was made in the image of God. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. The specific rules that follow, you can pick grain, but you can't grind it. They were just meant to prop up this main purpose. A concern for human life and a concern for the well-being, not only of the people who practiced the Sabbath, but for everyone who was around them too. So when the Pharisees chastised Jesus and his disciples for picking grain to fill their empty stomachs, they got the rules right, but they missed the point. Love of God and love of neighbor. This becomes more obvious in the second Sabbath debate. Jesus is in the synagogue and meets a man whose hand hand is withered, and even knowing that it would be considered an unlawful act of work on the Sabbath, Jesus heals the man. The Pharisees are filled with fury, we're told. But through this healing, through the eating with the disciples, he is concerned with the well-being of those around them. He is showing love to the person he sees right in front of him, and through it, showing love to the God whom this person was made in the image of. He may have ignored some of the details, but he got the point. One night in my final year of divinity school, I was hanging out with some friends when one of them brought up something that he'd seen floating around the internet. It was an idea, and an idea that at least a few churches I've seen have tried, an idea that encouraged Christians to give up God for Lent. Now, I know I'm a little early. Lent isn't for another few weeks. And I know that giving up God for Lent maybe sounds absurd. And if not absurd, then at least 
a little counterintuitive. After all, aren't we supposed to give up something for Lent that brings us closer to God, not farther away? But that's the idea. Instead of giving up coffee or desserts or Facebook, give up God for Lent. Stop going to church. Stop reading the Bible. Stop praying. Stop doing whatever it is that connects you to God. And then see how your life changes. And if it does, maybe there's something to learn from that. And if it doesn't, well, maybe there's something to learn from that, too. This idea for an unusual Lenten practice came from an inkling that we might all have a little or a lot of the Pharisees in us. That perhaps we get so caught up in the details of when and where and how we're supposed to meet God so caught up in the PowerPoints and the technology and saying the right things and acting the right way, we get so tied up in these things that we start to miss the point, that we stop seeing God, and that we stop loving and serving our neighbor. Now, I don't really want you to do it this Lent. Um, I'll be gone next year, so maybe do it then. But in all seriousness, we have, we have been doing some form of this experiment for the past 10 months. We haven't really given up God, but when you can't meet in buildings, when seeing another person poses a risk to your health, when the normal ebb and flow of daily life is halted, well, we had to, get, we had to learn to let go of the details pretty quickly. And maybe in some backwards way that has actually recentered us on our purpose. Love God and love your neighbor. Now, as we look towards this next stage, as we start to get back some of those details, can we keep asking each other, what's the point? What's our purpose? And can we let go of the details when we need to? Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join with us as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostle Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give thanks this Sunday morning for the gift that it is to worship you wherever we are. We know that now, maybe more than ever before, it is indeed a gift to pause and rest and worship you. We give thanks on this Sabbath day for the reminder that you were a God who is concerned with our health and well-being, a God who encourages us to heal and rest. Help us to follow your example and to live into the meaning of the Sabbath as we work together not only for our own health and well-being, but for the good and well-being of all people. We pray for those in our congregation, our community, and our world who could use a little encouragement today, those who could use some comfort or company, those who could use your healing touch. As our school buildings continue to reopen, we give thanks for the teachers and parents, principals and superintendents, school boards and students who have given of their time, resources, and energy to make this school year possible. We pray that you would be with the nurses, doctors, and health care providers who are working taxing shifts to keep our communities and loved ones healthy. We pray that you would be with all of us in this time that is challenging for us all mentally, physically, and emotionally. And we remember today those for whom today is especially a struggle. We lift up Mary Nelson, Karina DeYoung, Camden Lager, Merle Birkeland, Joanne Nelson, and the family of Marv Olson as they grieve the loss of his daughter Rita, and the family and friends of Pastor Jim McBride as they grieve his loss. God, sometimes we lose our way. Sometimes we get so caught up in the details and the rules of what we're supposed to do that we miss the good news of your life and love that is for us all. We pray that when this happens, and we know that it will, that you would reorient us that you would challenge us like Jesus did with the Pharisees, that you would remind us of your purpose and use us for your purpose. In all we say and do, we pray that we would be messengers of your love to all people. All this we pray for the one who came into this world to embody your love and grace to us all, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as Thou shalt choose. Take my life that I may be 
consecrated Lord to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my life that I may be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let us pray. Generous God, you have given us every good gift. You are the light in our darkest days. You are the hope of those who are hopeless. You are the one who brings good news to us all. We give you thanks for these gifts and so many more. We know we can never pay you back, but help us to give what we have for the sake of others, the, that the hungry may be fed, that the sick may be healed, that all might know your love. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You have listened to the gospel. You have listened to the sermon. You have joined your brothers and sisters in prayers and hymns. And now it is time for Holy Communion. God cares about your diet and wants to feed your stomach and your spirit. God wants to give you a palpable and chasting assurance that the promises of the gospel include you. You are God's beloved kid with whom God is well pleased. And God counts on you to continue being God's agent for good. This is what God declares to you in this unmistakable way. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please pray with us the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. See, touch, and chaste that the Lord is good, that the Lord loves you and counts on you. All are invited 
to the Lord's banquet, whether you are alone or with others. As you commune at home, if you are alone, please take the bread, put it now into your mouth, and here it told to you that this piece of bread that you are eating is the body of Christ given for you. Now, take the cup, drink from it, and hear it told to you that this drink that you are taking into your mouth is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you are two or more people having communion together, please give the bread and the cup to each other and be to each other the messengers of the marvelous news that this is the body of Christ given for you and that this is the blood of Christ shed for you.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Hear God's blessing of all of us. You are God's child, God's beloved, and God loves you just the way you are. This week, may you live unto this promise. May you be blessed to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, bringing light to those who sit in the darkness, bringing good news to the poor, bringing God's love to all people, bring a new life to all creation. In all that you do and wherever you go, know that Christ goes with you and God's light will shine in all you do. Amen. 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 Christ, Christ is, is with, with you. you. Share, Share the, the good, good news. news. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.